In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I sit here in the little grotto in my hometown church of Clinton, Mass., St. John, the guardian of Our Lady, church by the great ancestors of the faithful departed. I think so much of my granddad, James Hastings, who was so much a part of that early new evangelization of the Catholic Church. I think of my dad being such a pillar of this particular church on the altar as a lector for 45 years plus. Both my mom and my dad were catechists here in this particular church for many years and did great honor and service to Jesus by proclaiming the truth of the Catholic faith. I will be faithful to those words of our Lord through Mary and keep my teaching faithful to the Catholic catechism to now honor my parents, John and Mary Kilcoyne, with my ministry in gratitude for one great life lived. Amen. Talk Catholic. And now Talk Catholic with Tim Kilcoyne, a show about faith and other teachings. TalkCatholic.com with Tim Kilcoyne as we approach Holy Week, thus a time for self-examination. And I would urge you to check in with your local pastor or the diocese in general to see if there might be any special confessional days. Uh, There's a new ritual beginning to emerge whereby they have a whole day, 12 hours of confessions, and that can sometimes be more convenient for people. So just raise the issue. It's only a good thing to raise. And remember, and that is the key word as you go towards a self-examination of one's conscience, remembering is critical. We love to forget, especially our sins. So consider maybe a lifetime confession. Go back in time. I'm sure there were things that you might have forgotten when you did them. In other words, you never confessed them as sins in the first place, and the residual effect is still there. I know that the priest gives absolution for the forgiveness of all your sins. But let there be no doubt, there is a a special net effect of some of those sins that might have been omitted, obviously the more serious ones in particular, and just give it to the priest. You may not even remember exactly what it is. It could have a beautiful, refreshing effect upon you. You'll know the difference when you simply just get it behind you, however nebulous the memory. And indeed, memories matter. You can make a t-shirt out of that one, because they do. And so the memories can stay with you of the sin, even though the sin is forgiven. This is similar to why we have a purgatory that we pray for, so that we can be purified in the fire of the Holy Spirit and get rid of all this residual stuff If you want to use the common colloquial phrase of baggage, there's baggage quintessential that we really want to have to get rid of in order to be with our Lord face to face, the beatific vision in heaven one day. And in that spirit of memory, I want to rattle off a few little scripture quotes. Remember this day in which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Exodus chapter 13, verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11. Forget not the Lord thy God. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 16. There is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever. They may forget, yet will I not forget thee, God. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15. And the most important... This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. Our Jewish brothers and sisters, I've said this in a previous show, have done a wonderful job of keeping the memory of the great atrocity of Auschwitz and the Holocaust alive in our modern consciousness. And there is deliberate reason for that, so that it never happens again. And if we forget... Indeed, we do make the mistakes of history, and this movement towards dictatorship and the increasing loss of civil liberties, a diminishment of the dignity of people, our poor elderly in the nursing homes, and what we've done to them over a course of a whole year. Utterly disgraceful, may we take a page out of our Oriental brothers and sisters who have such a respect for our elderly. And it all has to do with forgetting, forgetting how we're supposed to be as a people, not only, and needless to say, as children of God, as citizens. And 
I therefore will be a stickler in keeping the memory of November 4th at 2.30 in the morning most alive. And it's not just because of partial political persuasion on my part. Everybody should be unbelievably worried and concerned that that free and fair elections did not take place. And indeed, there hasn't been evidence in the sunshine relative to why a national election came to a screeching halt and then started up again at 4.30 in the morning. So like a good solid confession that can be ultimately refreshing, we need to see the truthful evidence in the sunshine collectively as a people so that we can get on with the business of recognizing that we're not a banana republic. May that be part of the examination of everyone's conscience as we approach Easter, the very truth resurrected himself, Jesus. And in his Holy Spirit, may we recognize perhaps his hall of fame of saints that gave everything for him. In the first three centuries, I like to pick out a few saints. We won't have the body of writings that I usually do for our saint of the month because it's so long ago, but I'll offer some reflections for Holy Week in the second part after our intermission. So I'd like to begin with Saints Perpetua and Felicity from the website catholic.org. Saints Perpetua and Felicity were Christian martyrs who lived during the early persecution of the church in Africa by the Emperor Severus. With details concerning the lives of many early martyrs unclear and often based on legend, we are fortunate to have the actual record of the courage of Perpetua and Felicity from the hand of Perpetua herself, her teacher Satyrus, and others who knew them. This account, known as the Passion of St. Perpetua, St. Felicitas, and their companions, was so popular in the early centuries that it was read during liturgies. In the year 203, Vivia Perpetua, well-educated noblewoman, made the decision to follow the path of her mother and become a Christian, although she knew it could mean her death during the persecutions ordered by the Emperor Severus. Her surviving brother, another brother had died when he was seven, followed her leadership and became a catechumen as well, meaning he would receive instruction from a catechist in the Catholic Christian faith and be prepared for baptism. Her pagan father was frantic with worry and tried to talk her out of her decision. At 22 years old, the well-educated, high-spirited woman had every reason to want to live, including a baby son whom she was still nursing. We know she was married, but since her husband is never mentioned, many historians assume she was already a widow. Perpetua's answer was simple and clear. Pointing to a water jug, she asked her father, See that pot lying there? Can you call it by any other name than what it is? Her father answered, Of course not. Perpetua responded, Neither can I call myself by any other name than what I am, a Christian. This answer upset her father and he attacked her. Perpetua reports that after that incident she was glad to be separated from him for a few days, even though that separation was the result of her arrest and imprisonment. Perpetua was arrested with four other catechumens, including two slaves, Felicity, Rovacatus, Satyrinus, and Secundulus. Their instructor in the fate, Satyrus, chose to share their punishment and was also imprisoned. Perpetua was baptized before taken to prison. She was known for her gift of the Lord's speech and receiving messages from God. She tells us that at the time of her baptism, she was told to pray for nothing but endurance in the face of her trials. The prison was so crowded with people that the heat was suffocating. There was no light anywhere, and Perpetua had never known such darkness. The soldiers who arrested and guarded them pushed and shoved them without any concern. Perpetua had no trouble admitting she was very afraid. But during all this horror, her most excruciating pain came from being separated from her baby. The young slave, Felicity, was even worse off. For Felicity suffered the stifling heat, overcrowding, and rough handling while being eight months pregnant. Two deacons who ministered to the prisoners paid the guards to place the martyrs in a better part of the prison. There, her mother and brother were able to visit Perpetua and bring her baby to her. When she received permission for her baby to stay with her, she recalled, My prison suddenly became a palace for me. There, ladies and gentlemen, is the reason she is the saint of mothers and expectant mothers. And is that not the attitude that we don't hear often enough in our society today. My prison became a palace for me when she saw her baby son. Once more, her father came to her, begging her to give in, kissing her hands and throwing himself at her feet. She told him, We lie not in our own power, but in the power of God. When she and the others were taken to be examined and sentenced, her father followed pleading with her and the judge. 
The judge, out of pity, also tried to get Perpetua to change her mind, but when she stood fast, she was sentenced with the others to be thrown to the wild beasts in the arena. Perpetua recanted how her brother spoke to her, Lady Sister, you are now greatly honored, so greatly that you may well pray for a vision to show you whether suffering or release is in store for you. Perpetua, who spoke to the Lord often, told her brother she would tell him what happened the next day. While she prayed, Perpetua was shown a golden ladder of the highest length reaching up to heaven. On the sides of the ladder were swords, lances, hooks, and daggers, so that if anyone did not climb, looking up on heaven, they would be severely injured. At the bottom of the ladder laid a large dragon to try to scare those journeying up away from heaven. Perpetua first saw Satyrus go up. After he reached the top of the ladder, he said, Perpetua, I wait for you. But take care that the dragon does not bite you. To which she replied, In the name of Jesus Christ, he will not hurt me. And the dragon put his head down. Perpetua traveled up the ladder and saw a beautiful vast garden with a tall man with white hair dressed like a shepherd and milking sheep. Thou art well come, my child, he said to Perpetua, giving her some of the curds from the milk. She ate and all those around her said, Amen. Perpetua woke from her dream with a sweet taste still in her mouth at once she told her brother what happened, and together they understood they must suffer. Meanwhile, Felicity was also in torment. It was against the law for pregnant women to be executed. To kill a child in the womb was shedding innocent and sacred blood. Interesting to note that. In this respect, the Romans themselves were more pro-life than we are at the current time. Felicity was afraid that she would not give birth before the day set for their martyrdom, and her companions would go on their journey without her. Her friends also did not want to leave so good a comrade behind. Two days before the execution, Felicity went into painful labor. The guards made fun of her, insulting her by saying, If you think you suffer now, how will it stand when you face the wild beasts? Felicity answered them calmly, Now I'm the one who is suffering, but in the arena another will be in me suffering for me because I will be suffering for him. What marvelous testimony. She gave birth to a healthy girl who was adopted and raised by one of the Christian women of Carthage. The officers of the prison began to recognize the power of the Christians and the strength and leadership of Perpetua. In some cases, this helped the Christians. The warden let them have visitors and later became a believer. But in other cases, it caused a superstitious terror, as when one officer refused to let them get cleaned up on the day they were going to die for fear they'd try some so sort of spell. Perpetua immediately spoke up. We're supposed to die in honor of Caesar's birthday. Wouldn't it look better for you if we looked better? The officer blushed with shame at her reproach and started to treat them better. There was a feast the day before the games so that the crowd could see the martyrs and make fun of them. But the martyrs turned this all around by laughing at the crowd for not being Christians and exhorting them to follow their example. The four new Christians and their teacher went to the arena with joy and calm. Perpetua, in usual high spirits, met the eyes of everyone along the way. We are told she walked with shining steps as the true wife of Christ, the darling of God. When those at the arena tried to force Perpetua and the rest to dress in robes dedicated to their gods, Perpetua challenged her executioners. We came to die out of our own free will so we wouldn't lose our freedom to worship our God. Pretty hard to imagine, ladies and gentlemen, that these early Christians would be wanting to dialogue with the pagan gods. She and the others were allowed to keep their clothes. The men were attacked by bears, leopards, and wild boars. The women were stripped to face a rabid heifer. The two were thrown out and attacked, but the crowd cried out they had had enough. The women were removed in cloth again. Perpetua and Felicity were thrown back into the arena to face the gladiators. Perpetua called out to her brother and other Christians, Stand fast in the faith and love one another. Do not let our sufferings be a stumbling block to you. Perpetua and Felicity stood side by side and were killed by sword at Carthage in the Roman province of Africa. Saints Perpetua and Felicity are the patron saints of mothers, expectant mothers, ranchers, and butchers. Their feast day is celebrated on March 7th. May we honor them with a short prayer. Saints Perpetua and Felicity watch over all mothers and children who are separated from each other because of war or persecution. Show a special care to mothers who are imprisoned and guide them to follow your example of faith and courage. Amen. And before I pause for reflection, just add a few more greats in the Hall of Saint Hall of Fame. Saint Philemon, martyr with Apollonius, 
an actor at Antinoe, Egypt, in the Nile Delta. He was converted to Christianity by the deacon Apollonius and was arrested with him by Roman authorities during the persecution of Emperor Diocletian. Taken to Alexandria, they were wrapped in chains and hurled into the sea. St. Philemon died in 305. He is the patron saint of dancers, the athletes of God. Feast day is March 8th. Here is another relative unknown in that time period, St. Sabinus. He died in 287. His feast day is March 13th. He was a martyr, a native of Egypt. He was put to death by being drowned in the Nile during the persecutions launched by Emperor Diocletian. He was a procurator, possibly a bishop. During the persecution of Diocletian, he and several other Christians concealed themselves in a hut. Their presence there was ultimately revealed to the government by someone whose identity remains dubious. That person is described as either a beggar or a physician. Sabinus was then taken to Antonopolis, where, after being subjected to a variety of tortures, he was drowned in the Nile. It is known that he was a nobleman by birth who took in Christians and did work with the poor. He is recognized as a saint by several Christian churches. His feast day in the Roman Catholic Church is March 13th, and the Greek Orthodox Church, March 16th. And one more saint, upcoming after the break, who may be a real surprise to many. This is WQPH Radio, 89.3 FM. One of the earliest martyrs that we have records on, St. Photina. Her death was sometime in the first century. She is a Samaritan martyr. According to Greek tradition, Photiona was the Samaritan woman with whom Jesus spoke at the well and was recounted in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 4. Deeply moved by the experience she took to preaching the Gospel, received imprisonment, and was finally martyred at Carthage. Another tradition states that Photina was put to death in Rome after converting the daughter of Emperor Nero and 100 of her servants. She supposedly died in Rome with her sons Joseph and Victor, along with several other Christians, including Sebastian, Photius, Parasev, Photus, Siraca, and Victor. They were perhaps included in the Roman martyrology by Cardinal Cesar Baronius, owing to the widely held view that the head of Photina was preserved in the Church of St. Paul's outside the walls. In Eastern Orthodox and Eastern Catholic traditions, she is venerated as a saint with the name Photine, which means luminous. And her feast day is March 20th. There's a great movie to be made. Whatever became of the woman at the well? These are our rich traditions, ladies and gentlemen. As Mother Mary Angelica used to say, if you want to grow in your faith, get to know the lives of the saints and you'll begin to realize that things haven't changed very much. We've been going through this ordeal with the culture of death, the world, and we still have it right there before us right now as we approach Holy Week. You know, ladies and gentlemen, it has been said that the 20th century saw more martyrdoms, more Christian persecution in all of the first three centuries of church history combined. Pretty dramatic stuff. So this is not all part of museum talk. This is lived Christianity from generation to generation, which is exactly why the Word of God cuts across all time, all cultures. So where are the saints amongst us today? In the church. And in a great book called The Priests We Need to Save the Church by Kevin Wells, I think it's important to recognize that there are saints today who have been doing very similar heroic work and one such priest is Father Michael Deusterhaus, a priest from the Diocese of Arlington, Virginia. And he said, our church is dying, bleeding out, he said, because too many priests have chosen against embracing a life of sacrifice and mortifications, so they don't ask it of their parishioners. When my brother priests don't see the urgency and need of sacrifice for their flock during these tough days, then the spirit of their mission is lost. It's a slow drift, where the priest's tepidity leads his parish into a lukewarm land, and the downfall inevitably comes. The parish looks like it's alive, but really, it's dead. The former USMC lieutenant commander and battlefield chaplain has anointed soldiers in wide-open killing fields. He traveled with his mass kit throughout the Al-Anbar region of the Middle East, in Blackhawk and Osprey helicopters, 
in Zodiac boats over the Euphrates River and in armored Humvees, all to celebrate more than a dozen masses a week. His chapel's incense was perspiration, metallic sulfur, and burnt earth, and his choir's refrain was often artillery fire. His altar servers and lectors held loaded rifles. Roadside bombs upended four Humvees in which he was a passenger. As a consequence of his injuries and of the effects of three deployments in the mid-2000s, he feels as if he is walking on burning coals every day. Doctors told him that both of his feet require amputation. Father Deusterhaus didn't have the luxury of time to address the church's deeper issues while serving souls in Fallujah and Ramadi. Now that he's stateside, he remains diligent to his duty to Jesus Christ and his vocation to serve him, so he no longer minces words when he speaks of her shepherds. The stocky priest said that the principal plague of today's lackluster approach lies in Matthew chapter 25, verse 25, quote, And so out of fear I went off and buried your talent in the ground. Many priests are throwing the gospel and the fullness of the faith in a hole and burying it. Because of this, their parishioners are walking around starving to death without even knowing it. And then you find a parish full of modern-day Pelagians and Arians. Father Deusterhaus said that priestly mortifications, more than any other practice, would resurrect the spirit of the priest and his parish and help lead souls to heaven. The action of the self-sacrificing priest, he said, provides the seedbed for the church's regeneration. It's through a priest's daily self-renunciations that a gradual unfolding of graces rises within him. With those graces, he said, comes the uncommon courage and zeal to become a saint, which in turn drives his parishioners to desire the same. The bishops and priests who mortify themselves every day are the ones who continually create vocations because they feed the families at their parish the families are healthy, and healthy families produce priests. Getting up at any hour of the night for the parishioner, skipping a meal, rising early each day to pray, praying the daily office rather than reading it, praying aspirations throughout the day in your car, on your walk to the car, wherever, hearing more confessions, accepting to live in obscurity, being father nobody, whatever it takes. A priest has got to have a plan for each day and a plan for his life if he wants to help his parishioners get to heaven. The priest who mortifies himself prays more fervently. He takes his spiritual direction more seriously, maybe goes to confession twice a month. He's in the fight, and spiritual battle will come. But it's in that struggle in the spiritual realm and in the struggle for holiness that everything changes in his parish. His parishioners see that he's taking his fight for them seriously. But parishioners are smart. They also see the priest who has given up the fight where they say to themselves, oh, there's just no passion there. They've given up, and the slide in the parish begins. There's an enormous difference between a celibate priest and a bachelor priest. We have too many bachelors in our rectories. And in the spirit of this show, in honoring our saints who belong in a holy hall of fame, he finishes, Father Deusterhaus does, referencing the 86-year-old Turkish bishop Polycarp, seemed to set the priestly standard in the year 108 when he was wheeled into the Roman arena to be set on fire. Eyewitnesses said a voice from the heavens could be overheard. Be strong, Polycarp, and play the man. Polycarp told them, why delay? Why delay indeed? Off to the confessional this week, all of us with Holy Priests. WQPH Radio 89.3 FM. Blessings for a fruitful Holy Week, everyone. May you put it all behind you that you might rise again next Sunday with Jesus. God bless you. Let your light shine. That is what it's all about here at WQPH Radio 89.3 FM. But we need to hear your story. You want your voice to be His voice. That is making the faith known to others. Please, my number is 877-625-3727, Tim Kilcoin, TalkCatholic.com. Say, Mother Teresa told us, your ministry is your work right where you are. Grab on to this microphone. God bless.